Let's give a good ABAC welcome to Courtney Bay Taylor. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. I'm so excited to see all your faces. Um, this is my first stop on the tour, so it's exciting to see Georgia in a whole new way. Um, and I'm excited to share Concentrate with you. This is a picture of me and my cousin. Um, I'm the little one on the floor. This is sometime during the 1990s at my aunt's house in Cincinnati. And so my cousin would often braid my hair in the summers. And so this is a picture from one of our moments together in my childhood. I think there's such intimacy in sitting between an elder's knees and getting your hair done as a black child. It's a loving act because someone's taking time out of their day to beautify you. Um, but it's also an act of struggle. There's pain and discomfort sometimes. There are instructions you have to follow, like turn your head, sit up straight, certain ways you have to angle your body. For the person doing the hair, there can be exhaustion in the skill itself. It takes hours to finish braids. It takes moments of rest. But in the end, these two people have spent hours in connection with one another. And I think of black girlhood as being made up of years and years of those hours. And so my book, Concentrate, begins as a stream of dialogue between an aunt and niece sitting in this exact position. And as the niece is getting her hair straightened, the aunt is telling her the story of Latasha Harlins. And Latasha was a 15-year-old black girl living in South Central Los Angeles. And in March of 1991, she enters a corner store called Empire Liquor Market to buy a bottle of orange juice. And the shopkeeper there, a Korean American woman named Suja Du, assumes that she's trying to steal this bottle of orange juice. So the two of them have an altercation at the front counter. At the end of it, Latasha takes the orange juice, puts it on the counter, turns to leave, but Suja Du shoots her in the back of the head, killing her instantly in the store. Um, so Latasha's story is at the center of my book, Concentrate. And through her, I'm trying to navigate black girlhood, both its unparalleled beauty and terrible precarity. So far, my sentence as a black woman has been hard to hone, homed in sore white pith. Put graciously, black womanhood has been a limb that's fallen asleep beneath me. Paddy wagon of spinal cords and Baltimore's traffic up ahead, this whole color was a mistake. A leak in the ceiling whorehouse, a confused ass whooping, you see the baby in the blinds, the eager run in nylons, a public school lisp making room for the velour of her name. I was one of them in grade school. It seemed my whole class had fallen asleep in front of a microwave. I drew faces on my galas, then ate them off. God to me was my distantly gentle Aunt Notary, brilliant completely, Virginia Slims and breadsticks, the shade on her side of Brewster slouched the coolish way a suburb deserves. Sunday, she was an usher with one breast. I crept to mom and pops where bells above doors snitched to mention my entrance, but I told them bells. I was toys to be bothered. I had made such toyish mistakes. In any black sentence, you'd love nothing more than to have made no mistake. Before I knew of Latasha Harlins, my first perception of any tension between black and Asian American communities was in the context of black beauty supply stores owned by Asian American people. Um, black women and girls growing up would recount instances of racial profiling in some of these stores. And so as a child, hostility between communities of color was a really strange thing to reckon with. I think in America, we tend to frame racial opposition as a strictly white and black construct. But black beauty supply stores were the first place I saw white supremacy as something that could operate without white people physically being in the room. And so I took this photo at a black beauty supply store in North Carolina. Um, I was there with my mom. And what we're looking at here is the front counter of the store. And taped to the face of it are screen grabs from the store's security camera footage. These are images of black women. And you can see they're walking the aisles. And we're to believe they've either just shoplifted or are preparing to. 
and the owners of the store have added their names of each suspect and included the role they play in the crime. So here we see Taniqua is the shoplifter and Kiera is the driver and accomplice. And so to me, entering this store, this counter becomes a bulletin of black criminality. It's meant to be a preventative measure to discourage future thieves or if Taniqua and Kira return, seeing their images here might deter them from taking anything else. But as someone of the same gender and racial identity as those displayed, I speculate about the owner's speculation of me. As a black customer entering the store, I'm the audience for this display and therefore I'm the person being warned. So I took these pictures at the store and I paired them with lyrics from Black Korea, song by Ice Cube. And this was a song released in 1991 and it was written most likely in response to the murder of Latasha Harlins, but also a general reflection of anti-blackness in South Central's Asian owned businesses. And so this is a collage that appears in the book. And when I first created the piece and was working with Ice Cube's lyrics, I removed the stereotypical phrases that he uses in these lyrics. So there are a couple places where he refers to Asian shop owners as chop suey and oriental. And so instead of putting those words in the poem, I wanted to kind of leave them out, but leave open brackets to to show that there, there are words there, but I'm not choosing to use them. Um, because kept keeping those words in the collage felt like a reproducing the harm that those words cause. But then later, the removal of those words felt like a sort of sanitation. I think those words are important to see to give context to the full unsightly picture of racial um, tension at the time and the tension that defined that particular period in South Central. Um, in Ice Cube's song, Black Korea, rectifying anti-blackness means protesting, it means boycott, but also means harm back for harming. Throughout the book, I have Yelp reviews from various businesses across the United States. I would go on Yelp and, and look up reviews for black beauty supply stores and then take some of the language and make my own um, Yelp reviews. So I'm gonna read a couple of those. Worst experiment of my life. They are located at the crosswalk of Phoenix and Fifth where lots of blacks live. I just went in there for hair and noticed I was being watched through mirrors and corners though I go nowhere looking broke, I got jobs. But since I'm black, this female just knew I was gonna steal something, right? So I found the yakki I wanted and went over to check out where I asked this heifer point blank what her issue was and she gonna say some shit like safety. I was hot, y'all. I said, I don't need to take shit from here. I got jobs, plural, okay? And once the hood gets wind of your little attitude, this hair store gonna go dark through the windows forever, baby. No response. She didn't even bag my packs. Won't be back. I tutor at the center for writing and speaking. My job is to lend an editorial hand. The work consists of two hour shifts, four days a week, during which I situate in a room bordered with the blooms and cows of O'Keefe. I get 11.50 for every hour my assistance lasts. If someone especially likes my help, they'll arrange a weekly session. I meet a certain student Wednesdays on a love seat beneath black iris. Our mother languages make these sessions a Tetris. For the tutti, I suspect, I'm an oddly dark reminder of the English and the eagle left to earn. I've been detrimentally molded for my role here. Ebonic nicks on my tongue took long walks down rank MLK parkways so that I could shuffle like Cupid through some beneficial hinges. As a tutor, my job is to initiate that same vernacular evacuation in others. At our seventh session, I review an essay in which the prompt instructs her to write about a time when you experienced culture shock, the feeling of displacement, discomfort, or uneasiness when entering a new society or way of life. She writes that while living in South Korea, her perception of America was tutored by television. White chicks sprawled like used parachutes on the hotel coast of Californian beaches. I think maybe Laguna Beach or Baywatch. 
then men in the States, rock stars sharpened by Percocet and leather, incorrect presidents or fragile average Joes, I think maybe DiCaprio or Cusack, the bow of say anything. But when my tutti arrived, she did not arrive on a beach or DC's foggy bottom, Compton, all naked of glamour and skyscraper, the south side, cockeyed, cockamamie, off center, off white. When I arrived, I was disappointed. Where was white bay, white buck, white belt, white rot, white hope, white cells, the White House? I did not know there would be so many black people here. White trash, white wash, white ways, white flight, white night, white chick, white chocolate. I was disappointed to see so many black people here. Racist. We ate at a breakfast food truck parked across the way. I had too much juice and of course there were no restrooms, so I walked across the street to this braiding salon hoping to use theirs. When I got inside, they told me there were no restrooms to use, none at all. Mind you, my two friends had gone to this exact same salon just 15 minutes prior and were allowed to use the restrooms, no eye rolling, no teeth sucking, no questions. So I asked these ladies why my friends had been allowed to use their restroom, but I wasn't. They just shrugged and scrunched their eyebrows up at me like they had no clue what I was saying. I'm Asian. My two friends are white. It should be considered. Light Attire is a poem that appears in Concentrate, and it's composed of descriptions and photographs of black women and girls that I found on police missing persons flyers and the FBI's most wanted list. And so in putting this poem together, this visual collage, I'm reflecting on the ways black women and girls are neglected, reduced, and fused together by how they're defined on these flyers. Through Light Attire, I'm wondering, how are we as black women and girls defined by our absence and in our absence? So to compose this piece, I took words from the flyers remixed them and compiled them. I also merged faces and reflecting on the ways we are lumped together by stereotype um, to the point of being indistinguishable altogether. But I'm also thinking about the ways we as a community are burdened by the same assaults, the same erasure and the same misdefinitions. I also did erasures of the language that I found on these flyers. And so on this page at the very bottom, we have the phrase, no clothing was located in the area, was last seen wearing light. And so that final line was originally something like, was last seen wearing light blue pants. Um, but in my abbreviation, I'm considering what it must be like to think back to the last time you saw someone, not knowing it would be the last time. I think grief can make that last moment light up for us in a certain way. So I was really taken by the idea of light in the memory of those we've lost. And this last page is kind of like my call to action. It's my way of saying our lives um, as black women and girls are deserving of memory. And so this page is a compilation of clothing from several flyers put together. And so it becomes this one unbelievable outfit. And it says, the unidentified skeletal remains of a black female wearing a red Pringles chip t-shirt, blue jeans and white shoes, a red hooded jacket, guest jacket, and a multicolored scarf, yellow sundress, sweats under the dress, a Bruins cap should be considered. And so a Bruins cap is the piece of, one of the pieces of clothing that Latasha Harlins was wearing when she was killed. And so since she's shot in the back of the head, this Bruins cap becomes part of the story and part of the evidence of that case. In Concentrate, I'm saying that both Latasha and Sujadu should be considered. As a woman and a girl of color, they navigated terrains of racism and sexism. Suja faced physical and emotional abuse from her husband and Latasha was sexually abused by a counselor at the local recreational center. And so even though the story of Latasha and Suja is the story of white supremacist violence, and even though Suja is the guilty one in that story, there's also the story of male aggression in both of their lives. Latasha may have spent her last night of life with Jerry, that counselor from the wreck. 
I take the news of this tough as tit, hard as whip lavar, but shit, let that have been me. Aunt no tree at home, vibe magazine funneled to a gnat swatter on her lap, hair bonnet knotted and nails half periwinkle wet. She would have popped out of bed and steered the Buick with knees if it meant snatching me, her tried true maneuver to save me. But without black mamas on the night shift of our lives, many of our eyes on men go lilac with that tiny pink bow on the sternum of our undershirts missing. Having, in the nick of time, survived a man's one bed, I do admit turning my pelvis to begin it. Since everything that has a beginning must have an end, I let my assault begin so that it would end. I was at his all-white Nikes with bleach and an oral B, where I found a VHS called Can't We All Just Get It On, flattening some drugstore honey buns. I had agreed to watch it, but had agreed to nothing else. Say we condensed Jerry's rape to fit inside the archive. Clearly, there'd be a scale issue, so leave it out on 91st. We'll have it work where, as a college tutor, I shoo a leaf from its hood, and a docent offers up the number of autumns my abuser deserved to miss, if only you had given his name to name takers. Blue Tupperware still makes Russian dolls in the cabinet above the sink where I sprawled for relaxers, where Auntie rinsed cough syrup cups, snap peas, and soon I'll doll my daughter in loose jeans with no forgiveness. I'll swear to her that at first in life there will be no touching. Life will kick off like curfew at a bougie mall, and during her hard monarchy, the Holy Ghost will shout like sneezes in a hand. Guilt will whoop the habitat behind every man's head, and to his crimes will be ready to say, you tried to kill me, but you missed. Now who's the master of what happened? March 16th, 1991. At the scene, the Angels PD urged Mr. Dew, Sir, lower your hand. During the death, Mr. Dew was asleep in the family van. The bark of the shot, the snitch of surveillance, it conceives Ali, butterfly bee, under which Suja dissolves. Knuckles were no foreign performance in their marriage. In mine, wife beaters yank back my wig caps all the time. Above each assault, white Jesus lit his Lucy, and I became the cameraman involved. All I could think was Ellis the island and Mamie the mast, a ton in our shooting deaths. Blood orange and blood of baby girl whiffed up from the sill, both swearing in patois and smelling lilac good. But then Jesus ashed his cig and clocked out of his shift. He no longer needed women of color to make his point about obedience. He had mammograms and Candyman for that. A city's number one killer of people is people who are obedient to their senses, sense outlawed. Now, wouldn't that be trife? Jesus would need us so pathetically then. But in any life, it's never my business why the savior is the color of a wedding dress and not tap shoes. I'll have my book of light and he'll have his. For killing anyone, he and mammograms have their lofty reasons, and our men have theirs, tenderized as they are. But any afterlife, a paradise, is no killer of colored girls, even when pushed. The skies of that sort of nirvana are innocent and inconsolable as we laze forward, inventing simultaneous gods to save us, honorary gods of pan-sex, midterms, safe medication. We create gods without histories, without which they are made only of air and belief. No punishment. March 1991 to June 1995. Latasha's gravesite in Paradise Memorial Park may have been disturbed in a slew of unearthings initiated by the cemetery proprietors in the 90s. If so, she was exhumed and flung onto a mound with other bone black remains. The location of the pile is unknown to me, though you know it's a way of reselling plots, of making space for the lucrative business of dying. You know cemeteries know better. You know where this cemetery stay. You got bones to suck the marrow out of when it comes to any paradise. Paradise shouldn't be the name of no cemetery. 
There are no cemeteries in Paradise, the novel. Men shiv women in a convent, and when it's time to pile the bodies, our bodies are nowhere to be disturbed. No air, no punishment. Paradise. I was able to visit LA once Concentrate got picked up for publication. And this trip to LA was my opportunity to step into the city I had been so consumed by in the research. Um, and so I turned my field notes from this trip into a photographic essay called Four Memorials, which runs throughout the book. And it follows me on my visits to five locations that I think are central to our memory of Latasha Harlins. And so I'm gonna close the reading out by reading um, the first section of the essay, which is about my visit to the grounds of Empire Liquor Market, um, where Latasha was killed. While writing Concentrate, I was often nagged by the haint of reluctance. It was driven by an insecurity surrounding my lack of proximity to the subject. I was writing about a city I'd never been to, fumes I hadn't witnessed, a span of years in which I wasn't even thought of yet. Girl, reluctance said, all you got is second hand. So I head to LA to handle the archive, to stand at the foot of every place I talk up, to earn the facts and their phantoms firsthand. The epicenter of my curiosity is 91st and Figueroa, the lot on which Empire Liquor Market stood. Empire, a collection of states under one dominion, omnipotent premises, a territory implying power and power implying those who die in the course of courting it. On 91st and Figueroa stood a structure, a system akin to a kingdom. Business never resumed after Latasha was killed inside. Vacancy made it a feasible target. On the first night of revolution, there were several attempts to incinerate it. But black residents living next door at the Webb Motel stayed up into the wee hours, filling garbage cans with water. Living so close by, barely two feet from the store, they knew the fate of empire would have also been the fate of their home. To save their own lives, they had to save this monument of brutality, our survival inextricable from the structures that threaten it. In the late 1990s, Empire's signage was peeled from the building and replaced with that of Numero Uno Market. This is the face that greets me now. Unlike the stone white dress of its predecessor, Numero is a pink and green shock to the street. I see a parking lot and a threshold in the back where trucks relieve themselves of cereal, seafood, juice. Inside, three officers linger by the liter sodas. I watch a butcher conceive slivers of meat. A child walks aisles freely, motherless, unhesitant. I make efforts to push my shoulders back, but hesitate. I grab a grocery bag, eager for artifact. I hover at the refrigerators, eyeing a camera above the door. I walk around, consumed by questions of configuration. Is everything in the same place? Is this where Suja tended the counter, a gun her clandestine companion? Evidence takes imagination now. But those who love Latasha do imagine. In 2016, on the 25th anniversary of her loss, photos slouched against this edifice. Balloons ascended by the fence, dressing the hood in cool helium. On the sidewalk, a pastor prayed for protection, for wherewithal, for a heaven-eyed CCTV. Numero's sidewalk was also the location for an interview with Latasha's aunt, Denise Harlins. Denise helped raise Latasha, a duty assumed in her 20s after Latasha's mother was murdered in a nightclub. Denise took over the role of hair and heart care. Like many black women, Denise found herself swept into a motherhood necessitated by grief. The interviewer asked Denise if she ever got the chance to see Suja do in the flesh. I watch Auntie look up and off camera, ushering in that memory. Oh yeah, I saw her. I went to court. It was only one day I missed court, and that day I had to, that night, I had to go to the hospital because both my glands were swollen up so bad because I was out here doing the work. I ain't going to lie to you. The work of petitions, politicians, protest, and on the first night of uprising, 
assisting the Web Motel. Denise hoped to transform Empire into a center of excellence for South Central children. All of her work are resistance, and such resistance menaces the body. In resistance, we are at the neck of injustice, holding our breath, proving our matter. Resistance antagonizes immunity, makes us prone to roadrunner pulse. Epidemiologist Sherman A. James calls this John Henryism, theorizing that the tireless effort required to combat racial injustice has a direct correlation to the prevalence of hypertension in black communities. Aunt Denise died of congestive heart failure. You'd be a fool to assume the work of resistance had no part, no say, no hand. Denise continued. That day of the hearing, and it was probably divine intervention, my glands were so swole I couldn't go to court. And I seen it on TV. And when the verdict came back, I fell on my knees and I just shouted to my highest high and I was angry. I knew the fix was in then. I knew the fix was in then. But there are no signs of murder, memorial, or resistance when I arrive. The ground is like any ground. Normalcy devastates. Stillness lies to me about history. Thank you. <laughs> Latasha was killed over a bottle of orange juice, so thinking about from concentrate, not from concentrate. So there were originally some poems in there about the history of orange juice, but um, I removed those poems in editing. Concentrate also in, it's kind of like a, a request of the reader before entering the book. If you have a physical copy of the book, there are no poem titles, you know, things kind of run into each other and it requires a certain meditation on the work and a kind of following me in all these different places that I'm going. I think of the book as a collage and so it requires concentration in that way. And so I think of the title in, in those two ways. It's a good question, thank you. Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, it went to trial and uh, Sujadu was given a fine of $500 and five years probation, but no jail time. And so um, Latasha's murder happens and then the beating of Rodney King happens. And so a lot of us think of the LA riots as being spurred directly by Rodney King, but Latasha Harlan's murder precedes that and is also part of what is happening in the uprising. In addition to economic injustice and a lot of other issues that are prevalent in the black community in South Central at the time. Um, so the book really started with an interest in this idea of there being tension between black and Asian communities. And so I was really interested in where that tension comes from and what the truth of that is. I think um, a lot of times we don't talk about the unity and solidarity between communities of color. So I was also interested in writing towards that. Um, but then I started to learn more about Latasha Harlan's beyond just this symbol that she is for tensions between the communities. Um, there's a really good book called The Contested Murder of Latasha Harlan's and it's like very comprehensive scholarship on her life on uh, Sujadu's life and the life of um, the judge, Joyce Carlin of the case. And so after reading that book and learning about Latasha's 15 years of life and, and not just her death, I was really interested in her black girlhood and the ways it differed from mine, intersected with mine. And so it became part of the way I was navigating black girlhood in general. And so that's how she kind of enters the book for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, would you say that there's maybe more or less um, racial tension between the Asian American community and the black community as opposed to like black on black crime in the gangs? Um, so one thing I'll say is I think black on black crime is a myth kind of created to like make this idea that there's like some kind of violence between us that is is not created by white supremacy and, and white supremacy kind of being the root of, of a lot of the dangers that exist of being black in America. In terms of um, 
tension between black and Asian communities and if there's more or less. Um, I think that's an, also another distraction. And so kind of what I tr write about in the book is that this all centers on white supremacy and the things that white supremacy has created in order for it to seem that there is a tension between us and kind of diverting our eyes from the larger um, system that is oppressing us. In the book, a, a big thing that I want to do is shine light on the ways that we've always been in solidarity. And so that solidarity isn't a new thing. It's a thing that existed before the LA riots and it's a thing that continued afterwards. Um, and that same solidarity extends to all communities of color. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of focus on, on the ways that our community is building with one another. Thank you. Sims and D.R. Millard, when I looked them up, I said, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really good question. So James Marion, uh, J. Marion Sims was kind of thought to be the founder of modern gynecology. And so in order to test out the vaginal speculum, he, he used slaves without their consent, and, and it was a lot of brutality in, in how the modern day speculum came to be. And then um, in terms of the um, other doctor that's mentioned there, this the creator of the double eyelid surgery, which is a surgery to kind of like Europeanize or make less quote unquote Asian the visual. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, and, and what's interesting in the book there where I talk about those things, um, the back of the book, it, it's kind of noted that even though they're on a timeline, I don't equate those two experiences and I don't at all because I think the his black history and Asian American history is completely um, separate within with its own nuances. But what I'm trying to do there is point to the ways that white supremacy has both impacted our communities um, and how we see ourselves today. It's a really good question, thank you. I was just wondering, <clears throat> so is, is telling these stories and putting these stories out, are the, is that the best way that we help stop these issues from being so common to uh, mm. like being a systemic racism and all those things? Is, is that how we kind of dispel those things from being so common? Yeah, that's such a, that's like the major question, right? Um, I think for me, um, I can speak for what it does for me, I think there's a little bit of it that is reclamation. So this idea that we only think of Latasha Harlins or Trayvon Martin or Tamir Rice as being murdered, but not as much looking at their lives and like the beauty and the complexity of what it means to be alive in a black body. Um, I wanna give that to Latasha and I wanna give that to us. And so that's an important part of, of why I'm kind of telling this story. Um, and I think it's important for like black communities, communities of color, marginalized communities to tell their stories, to kind of like reclaim their voice because so much of our lives are like kind of constructed like by the system. And so it's a way for me to kind of have my voice out there. In terms of the larger issue of how we can rectify these things, I think that's a question for white supremacy to answer and I think as long as that exists, we'll continue to have those sorts of tra uh, tragedies. And so it is, um, I think of myself and uh, all artists, black artists as working despite that ever looming system. And it's a miracle we can even create under that. And so I think this particular book is just to pay homage and um, celebrate black girlhood. Thank you. Yes. Do you think the concept of intersectionality not being as magnified back in 1991 in Washington tend to correlate to LA riots going through Washington as opposed to like, you know, having Trayvon Martin and then Sandra Bland start to say her name in the, in the Capitol? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, I do think. Someone would have to tell me, because when, whenever Kimberly Crenshaw came up with intersectionality, like the term, like what year that was. But um, 
I think there's a definitely, I feel like we're still fighting as black women to be, um, to have our stories um, as recognized. I think that's a, a continual thing, especially when it comes to like uh, white supremacist violence, police brutality. Um, I think what's really important is I think we don't pay enough attention to the ways that black women are um, oppressed and are seen as um, targets by police as well and in, in different ways, but in just as important ways as we think of black men. Um, yeah, and I, I definitely think the, the, um, the light that was like kind of focused on Rodney King and, and not having that for Latasha, there definitely is um, differences in identity and just like how hard it is for black women and girls to be seen and like recognized. I even think um, there are ways we're still working towards that even in our movements today. So it's like a constant thing. And I think that's another reason why it was important for me to, to tell this story. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, about the collage in the book, how you intended for that medium. Like, is, is this a, is this a long-term thing for you that mm -hmm. predates this project, or is it something that responds to some of your earlier inspiration? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that this was some, this wasn't a long kind of thing. It was recent that that poem, Light Attire, um, it was before the pandemic that I made that, but that poem kind of came about because um, one day I was just thinking about a black girl who had been missing in my childhood. Her name was Alexis Patterson, um, and she was, went missing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they never found her. And so I think I was just curious to see if they found her. At so many years had gone by. Um, and so then I came across her flyer, which is still online um, and just became interested in the, the missing persons flyer as a form and the structure of it, that it's meant to kind of summarize a person, kind of reduce them to these details so that you can find them. And so a structure like that can't capture a full human being. So I was just really interested in that and, and just kind of printed off the flyers and cut out pieces. And so it was really the first time that I had created a collage um, or at least like taken that much time to really devote to it. And I found that making that collage allowed me to comment on, on um, black girlhood in a very unique way that poetry hadn't allowed me to do. And so I do credit that poem for open, opening me up to other collages and other ways of trying to describe um, what I'm trying to explain in the book. And so I, I do think that I would consider myself an interdisciplinary artist because I think that there are certain forms like essay. So like when I talk about directly going to LA and stepping into those places, it's important for that to be an essay, whereas something else, it's important for it to be a visual because there's nothing I could say that could describe what it's like to, to see these things. And so, yeah, I think, I think I would continue to work in the visual space. It's so interesting to me. So since working on this book, I've made some other collages um, and I don't really have an idea of where they'll go, but it, it is kind of opening my creativity in a certain way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for your you. Time. Thank you.